But you can open up your Bible to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 8 through 15. And Paul has been setting forth the complete sufficiency and supremacy of Jesus Christ. And we've seen in glorious fashion the exclusivity of Jesus as the unparalleled supreme one. Jesus is truly astonishing. He is the unparalleled supreme one, and it is in him that we find and have all that we need. Everything of value is found in Jesus. Jesus is above all. All things were created by him and for him, and all things are held together by him. He is preeminent over creation. All the answers for life All the answers for our soul, for our eternity, for our struggles, for our pains, for our hardships, for our hurts, for our joys, for our peace, for our hope is found in Jesus. Everything, everything that has value is summed up in Jesus Christ. Everything that has meaning for this life and the life to come is found in the person of Jesus. We saw in verse 3 of chapter 2, in him is all the treasures of wisdom and understanding. All that wisdom and knowledge have to offer is found in Jesus. It cannot be overstated how utterly and completely transcendent Jesus is. And in verse 4 of chapter 2, Paul warns against those who would seek to delude the Colossians trying to convince them that these realities regarding Jesus are actually not true. Beware of those who would consider Jesus not enough, not sufficient, not supreme. Watch out for this kind of thinking. And in verse 6, Paul gives the first command of the book, it is to walk in Christ. And then in our passage, we're going to see the next command. And in the second command of the book, Paul is even more directly attacking the falsehood being perpetuated. In chapter 3, Paul will transition to instructing the Colossians on how to live in the fullness of Christ. But in these verses that we're going to look at this week, today, and Lord willing, next week, Paul is going to put a hard stop on worldly thinking. He's going to put a hard stop on worldly thinking that would confound or detract from the reality of who Jesus is and what Jesus has accomplished. Let's look together, starting in verse 8 and making our way through verse 15 this morning. Colossians 2, starting in verse 8. It says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Be on guard from worldly thinking, looking to Christ as the standard. Be on guard from worldly thinking, looking to Christ as the standard. The instruction here that Paul gives is to keep watch, to look out, to give careful attention that you are not enticed or taken captive by worldly thinking, by 
what Paul says is philosophy and empty deception rather than according to Christ. You see, Christ is the standard. And there is to be a watchfulness. We are to be on guard that we're not taken captive by thinking that is contrary to Christ. Be on guard from worldly thinking, looking to Christ as the standard. Paul gives this command, and then we see four reasons why we should be on guard against worldly thinking, holding to Christ as the standard. But before we dive into those reasons, let's look at this command a little closer. Paul says, see to it. Do you see that in verse 8? See to it. This is a continuous watchfulness. This would be like saying, watch out or look out. There's urgency to this command. And yet, unlike a moment of caution, which quickly passes, this watching out is to be continuous, ongoing, perpetual. This is to have alert senses being on guard continually. And what are we to have this kind of continuous watchfulness over? Well, Paul tells us that no one takes you captive Avoid capture of worldly thinking. Have you ever thought about worldly thinking that way, that it is seeking to capture you? It is seeking to take you away? To carry you off? The the idea here is, is don't be carried away from truth and taken captive by error. Look at verse 8 again. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. We are to continually be watchful that we are not taken captive by philosophy and empty deception. Well, what is this? What is philosophy and empty deception? Philosophy philosophy simply means love of wisdom. By itself, it's a neutral word, meaning it doesn't carry a negative connotation in and of itself. But here it is clear that this is a love of wisdom that is outside of God. It's not according to Christ. That's what Paul is addressing here. And Paul is condemning this so-called wisdom that's being propagated, which was claiming insight into things such as the worship of angels, as well as legalistic and ascetic practices. And when Paul says philosophy and empty deception, it could be better understood that Paul is saying, beware of empty, deceitful philosophy. An empty, deceitful love of wisdom that is not consistent with Christ, that is not according to Christ. And the origin of this harmful philosophy is that it is rooted out of the traditions of men not according to Christ. It is humanly engineered ideas, and these are taken from the elementary principles of the world, that is, the basics, the ABCs of worldly thinking. There's no vertical aspect to this thinking, but it is bound horizontally. False teachers were claiming a new spiritual insight and wisdom. And Paul says these teachings are basic. They aren't new. It's the same old trick and the same old sin, the same old rebellion. And it's in direct opposition to that which is according to Christ. And you need to watch out for this kind of thinking. Christ is the standard. And any thinking outside of him is to be rejected and guarded against. So be on guard from worldly thinking, looking to Christ as the standard. And then Paul's going to spell out some of the reasons why. Be on guard from worldly thinking, looking to Christ as the standard. Why? Well, first, because, number one, in Christ, the fullness of deity dwells. Number one, in Christ, the fullness of deity dwells. Look at verse 9. Paul says, for in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So Paul is saying here, reject worldly wisdom, philosophy, and empty deceptive philosophy, and cling to Christ because in Christ all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And Paul here is referring to divine essence. The sum total of deity resides in Jesus. Jesus. 
No element of the fullness of deity is missing in the person of Christ. And Paul is not saying that the second person of the Trinity is the only person of the Trinity or the supreme member of the Trinity. That's not what he's saying. It's not that Jesus partakes of an extra portion of divinity. There is one God who eternally exists in three persons, each of which share fully in the divine essence. And Paul's point here is to demonstrate that Jesus unquestionably shares fully in that divine essence along with the Father and the Spirit as the one true God. Paul is not instructing the Colossians to look at a mere man, but to look at God in the flesh to Jesus. When he pleads with them to be on guard against worldly thinking that isn't according to Christ, the reason why you wouldn't want to look to anything outside of Christ is because Jesus is God in the flesh. And where would we have to look other than to him? Fully God, fully man. And in this one verse, in succinctness, Paul establishes the reality of the person of Jesus being God in the flesh, decimating the redundant heresy that Jesus is something other than God in the flesh. In light of this, why would we entertain thinking rooted out of a worldview that sees Christ as someone other than God in the flesh? And yet Paul here is not only saying, don't entertain this kind of thinking, but he's actually calling the believers to give careful watch against this kind of thinking, contrary to what is according to Christ, that you not be taken captive by that kind of thinking. Be on guard. Be on guard from worldly thinking, looking to Christ as the standard. Why? Because number one, in Christ, the fullness of, of deity dwells. Next, number two, be on guard from worldly thinking, looking to Christ as the standard. Number two, because in Christ, the believer has been made complete. In Christ, the believer has been made complete. The reality of verse nine is truly astonishing, but Paul is not finished. Not only does the fullness of deity dwell in Jesus in bodily form, But in Jesus, the believer has been made complete. Don't give in to worldly thinking, but look to Christ as the standard, for in Christ, you believer, have been made complete. Look at verse 10. And in him, that is Christ, you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. Your completeness here is not referring to maturity, as sometimes we find, but rather that you have been given in Christ all that you need. Everything that you need in this life is found in Christ. All of our needs are fully met in Jesus as we are brought into union with him. The believer lacks nothing. Listen to this. Christian, you lack nothing. And possess all that you need to fulfill all of the purposes of God. Because of Christ, in Christ. Paul's going to expound on how this completeness was brought about, but just ponder for a moment the reality that there's there's nothing of value before God that you lack. And nothing you need outside of what Christ has provided. In Jesus, we have been made complete, and there's nothing to compete with this reality or that can prove this reality otherwise. Why? Why? Because Jesus is the head over all authority and rule. Jesus is the ultimate authority and is supreme over all spiritual beings, both in his creation of all things, as we saw in chapter 1, and in his conquer, conquering of all things, as we will see in a moment in verse 15 of chapter 2. So again, why would we entertain a way of thinking Why would we give worldly philosophy any consideration or place in our thinking in light of who Christ is and what he has afforded those who are his? 
We're complete in him. We don't need to look elsewhere. There's no problem so severe. There's no hurt so deep. There's no difficulty so intense that we need to look outside of Jesus to find the solution. And this should bring tremendous hope and comfort. I think sometimes this reality can bring discouragement to people because they're not thinking rightly about what this actually means and the implications of this. At times, there's a temptation to want to bring in worldly thinking and wisdom to try to deal with our problems. And we find ourselves only brought into deeper hopelessness as time after time, ultimately anything that is not according to Christ will fail us. And we will fail in them. But in Christ, in Christ is found everything we need every hardship. There is no sin that you have committed. There is no sin that has been committed against you. There is no pain that you have experienced that you have not been afforded the resources in Christ to be able to honor him in the midst of it. There is hope. Unquestionable, unshakable hope in Jesus. We need to be on guard against anything that would detract in our thinking or in our practices from looking to Christ. As we walk in Christ, we must give a a constant watchfulness that we are not being taken captive by thinking not in line with Jesus. Have you ever had a friend, somebody that you knew, and you knew them fairly closely, and they seemed really like-minded, solid, and then you didn't talk to them for a while, and they went their way, and you went your way, and then you reconnected, and all of a sudden they were saying things you never thought they'd say, and they were living ways you never thought they'd live, and they were explaining things in a manner that you never thought they'd explain them, and you're just looking at them, I I thought you loved scripture, I thought you loved Christ, and you're looking to anything and everything but Christ, and your heart just sinks. Taken captive. Taken captive. By worldly, false thinking, not according to Christ. We need to be on guard. We need to help each other in this. We need to care for one another in this. And this is helpful for our thinking. If you've ever been challenged on your thinking about something, I think sometimes we can find a temptation to want to put up defenses and how dare you question me? How how dare you question my motives or my thoughts on this? I have a verse for this and whatnot. We need to just take all safeguards to protect ourselves and put them down and open up ourselves and say, help, help me. If you want to speak into my life to help advocate for me to walk in accordance with Jesus, in accordance with God's word, there should just be no area of our lives that are untouchable or off limits and advocating for one another to think this way. How important is it for us to know God's word? When we talk about shepherding our hearts and reading our Bible every day, bringing our hearts before God's word to know him, to draw near to him. How important is this in keeping guard against worldly thinking? How much are you being attacked with worldly thinking versus how much you are fortifying yourself in thinking according to Christ? Where have you allowed worldly philosophy to infiltrate your thinking? Where are you tempted to believe that Christ is not sufficient? Christ is not sufficient like a, where he's not enough to to help us navigate the difficulties of life. Christ is sufficient. And you, believer, are complete in him. and, And he's sufficient, not in the way that you're exhausted, you've been driving all day, and you pull up to a hotel in the middle of nowhere, and it's nasty and dirty, and you open up the door, and you go, well, I guess it'll do. It's sufficient. That's not how Christ is sufficient. Christ is a beautiful, flawless mansion with an overabundance of all that we need that will never fail us. That is how Christ is sufficient. Amen. 
Christ fully satisfies. He fully provides for all that we need. And in light of this, we need to keep close watch that worldly thinking would not take us captive. Be on guard from worldly thinking, looking to Christ as the standard, because one, in Christ the fullness of deity dwells. Two, in Christ the believer has been made complete. And then in verses 11 and 12, we see in Christ the believer has been spiritually circumcised. In Christ, the believer has been spiritually circumcised. Look at the beginning of verse 11. And in him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Paul's driving home here, still what is true for the believers in light of their union with Christ. In Christ, the believer was circumcised, which would have been familiar terminology for his readers. Yet this circumcision was not made with human hands. On the eighth day, it was the regular practice that every Jewish boy be circumcised. This was a sign that he belonged to the covenant nation of Israel. Yet what Paul is referencing here, as he says, is a circumcision made without hands. And he says in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This circumcision made without hands wasn't a new idea to Israel. Deuteronomy 10.16 says, So circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. It has always been God's intention to address the heart of man. And God has accomplished this through Christ for everyone in union with him. What was demanded in the old covenant, he has done perfectly in Christ and he has brought it to fruition in his people by grace through faith. Thus, to be circumcised with a circumcision made without hands is to be born again into eternal life. The old life has been stripped off. In union with Christ in his death, our hearts have been circumcised not by an external removal of the flesh, but an internal old self being stripped off, which Christ performs on those who are made his. And then in verse 12, Paul continues his thought. Look at verse 12. He says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. This circumcision of the heart took place when you were buried with him in baptism. And this isn't the physical baptism of being submerged in water. That baptism is a symbol representing this work that Paul is describing. Paul's primary point here is that the old self was put to death through the circumcision of the heart and was raised up with Christ through faith. This is the complete work of salvation that is found in Jesus addressing the very nature and heart of man in his salvation work. So let's put this all together you could say it this, this way, in union with Christ in his death, our hearts have been circumcised, not by an external removal of the flesh, but an internal old self being stripped off with Christ, which Christ rather performs on those who are made his when you were buried in baptism by the spirit of God, which your water baptism represents and bears witness to. And you were also raised with Christ to newness of life, through faith in the work of God who raised Jesus from the dead. Can we just marvel at the work of Christ in the gospel? The wisdom of God through his son to bring about a newness of life, a stripping away of the old and a granting to those who were completely undeserving newness of life in Christ. This wisdom is unparalleled, and through it, you have fellowship with God and union with Christ. Now, why? Why would we ever entertain thinking that is not rooted in Christ in light of what he has accomplished? And why would we think a system of thought outside of Christ would provide a solution to any part of our lives? Again, keep watch from any thinking that would draw us away from thinking that is according to Christ. 
And then next, Paul is going to expound on this work. Be on guard from worldly thinking, looking to Christ as the standard, because number four, in Christ, the believer has been made alive. In Christ, number four, the believer has been made alive. Paul continues his thought looking more in depth at the state of the believer prior to salvation and what God has done for the believer in Christ. The main idea is that he, God, has made the believer alive together with Christ. We see that statement in verse 13. In Christ, the believer has been made alive. And then Paul's going to unfold this for us. The believer in Christ has been made alive, A, being brought out of death. We see that in verse 13, being brought out of death. Look at verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. He brought you out of that death that you were in, and he made you alive together with him. If you are a believer, you were made alive together with Christ when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Prior to salvation, you were dead spiritually, and you were dead in your specific transgressions against God. And Paul is writing to the Colossians, telling them they were dead in the uncircumcision of their flesh. The Colossians were not only guilty of individual sins, but were uncircumcised in body, thus being outside of God's covenant. The Colossians had no hope before God outside of God himself. And while Paul is referring to their physical circumcision here, their problem was not one of the physical flesh, but their physical uncircumcision was an outward sign of their uncircumcised hearts towards the Lord. This is the root of the problem for every individual, every single one of us. And this is the state of every individual ultimately apart from Christ, spiritual deadness. And yet, in Christ, the believer, though being in a state of deadness, being dead, is made alive by God through Christ, being brought out of death, and also being forgiven every transgression. That's what we see next. In Christ, the believer has been made alive, being brought out of death. And in Christ, the believer has been made alive, being forgiven every transgression. Look at the last part of verse 13. Having forgiven us all our transgressions. For the believer, God has decisively and completely dealt with every transgression against him. Every single transgression, every sin, every offense has been dealt with fully. And it has been forgiven. Every evil thought, every impure deed, impure motive, secret sin, harsh word, hateful thought. He has forgiven them all. We have been made alive being forgiven every transgression. And we have been made alive having every debt canceled. That's what we see next. We have been made alive in Christ, being brought out of death, being forgiven every transgression, and having every debt canceled. Look at verse 14. He says, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Paul enlarges upon this forgiveness, stating that the believer has had the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us canceled out. This forgiveness and canceling out were done in one simultaneous action. One divine motion brought about this unfathomable reality. This has been done completely and perfectly. Our debt has been canceled or wiped away. The written record against us has been expunged, erased, removed, blotted out. The certificate of indebtedness because of our sins, everything we owed, which we could never repay, has been taken care of. Our certificate of indebtedness, it was hostile to us in all of it. He has taken it out of the way, and every debt we owed was nailed to the cross. The record of our failures to keep God's law, 
is gone. It was nailed to the cross, and in so being nailed to the cross, it is obliterated. We are free from our sin debt before God. Can you imagine the excitement if one day you woke up and your mortgage was paid off? Every single payment that you owed on your 30-year mortgage, just done. Never had to make another payment again. The excitement that you'd feel, the relief that you'd experience, such a pitiful example compared to the matchless reality that for the believer, their eternal debt that they could never fully satisfy and repay, that they would spend eternity in hell under God's righteous wrath because of, has been done away with, canceled out. Oh, canceled out. This is what God has done through his son in the cross. We are free from our sin debt before God. And lastly, not only has he canceled out that debt, but he has done so victoriously. The believer has been made alive, having total victory over the opposition. There's no ongoing threat of that debt being brought up again. Just think about that for a moment. Think about the worst sin you've committed that you're aware of. And if somebody wanted to stand up and declare that sin in front of everyone here. There is no threat of that being done before God and you being found guilty for it. It has been forgiven. It has been canceled out. And not only did God bring us out of death, forgive every trespass, deal with every debt we owed, but he also made a public display of the demonic forces that used that record of indebtedness against us. Look at verse 15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. The imagery here is like a military commander or king returning home victorious, marching through the streets with the plunder he had claimed and the captive foes he had defeated. And God's victory is so certain that for the believer, there is no threat, there is no more threat to their eternal salvation as the opposing forces have been disarmed and have been put to appropriate open shame. And this triumphant victory is through Christ. His work on the cross and his resurrection have secured a resurrection for believers being made alive with Christ. One writer states it this way, the irony of ironies, the cross in which the evil powers thought they had defeated Christ was the cross through which he sealed their doom. It is through the cross that we who were doomed are set free. Now, once again, as we close this morning in light of this, why would we entertain as wise or give merit to any form of thinking that is not according to Jesus? What could a worldly system of thought add to Christ, to who he is, to what he has accomplished? And what might pose a threat that in light of what Christ has done in the gospel, we would think he is insufficient to handle. When you work through past hurts, where do you look? When you fight sin, to whom do you look? When you work on your marriage, to whom do you give a voice? How about parenting? Politics? Let every system of thinking be according to Christ and let us see and turn aside everything that is not as we cling to Christ, knowing that he is all we need. He has provided perfectly for us in him. We are made complete. We have all that we need in him. 
because of his great work, because of who he is and what he has done. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what you have accomplished in Christ. And Lord, as we consider the instruction from verse 6 in chapter 2 to walk in Christ that we looked at two weeks ago, help us to recognize the very real threat of allowing into our lives thinking that is not according to Christ. And Lord, let our walking in Christ not be stymied by worldly thinking, worldly philosophy, empty, deceitful, basic, trivial worldliness. But let us cling to Christ and all that pertains to him and all that he has given to us in your church and in your word, Lord that we would magnify him, that we would depend upon him, that we would look to him, that we would cling to him in all things. Resting not in the strength that we possess, but looking to what he has accomplished in the gospel. Resting in his blood, in his sacrifice, in his holiness, in his resurrection. Lord, I pray that we would be on guard that we would walk in a manner that is pleasing to you, that is in accordance with Christ. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.